No, thank you. Yes, so um, as, um, as you said, we, I work with, um, I'm a community archaeologist of Thames Discovery Project, uh, a community project that's been running for 10 years now um, on the River Thames in London in the UK. Um, it's our, actually our 10th birthday in a couple of weeks' time and we're having a big forum conference about that. Um, dreams come true when doing archaeology. This is actually a direct quote from an evaluation with one of our volunteers and that's just such a lovely thing. I have it up in my office just to remind me sometimes of why I do this job and why we do what we do. Um, so um, yeah, I wanted to talk about um, flexible volunteering. Um, Flexible volunteering, it's a term that's used in the UK, um, in America, in uh, Australia, I think it's also some European countries, I don't know if you people have mentioned there's different cultural um, differences around volunteering in Europe, but um, it's about providing more individualised ways for people to volunteer. Um, one of the big reasons why people don't volunteer is time, or at least that's what they report. Um, this is the Community Life Survey, which is an annual survey the government do with a big data set um, in the UK. And if you look at the reasons why people don't volunteer in the UK, it's all about time. This is the, ex I don't want to say excuse, that's the wrong word. This is the reason they give for not volunteering. I've got work commitments, I have to look after children or the home, I do other things with my spare time. And work commitments is way out there. But we know busy people do volunteer, so some people are able to prioritise um, um, what they do with their time to volunteer. So why do some people do that and other people don't? That's the question. Um, what we're finding more and more in the UK is how people choose to spend their spare time outside of work is becoming much more, um, much more choice, much more, um, there's little bits and pieces of stuff all over the place. So like, People come home on an evening and they'll decide, am I going to go to a restaurant? Am I going to sit and watch a Netflix box set? Maybe I'll mess around on the internet. Maybe I might do some volunteering. That's kind of how they would like to live their life. It's causing problems for the organisations that rely on the kind of traditional model of volunteering, if you like. You're expecting people to give a regular commitment, <coughs> perhaps sign up for life. So, for instance, the Scout Association, which is a youth organisation in the UK, it's called the largest youth organisation in the UK, built around volunteering, it's run by volunteers, um, they are struggling to recruit people because people don't want to sign up to spend every Thursday evening in a drafty old hut <laughs> in some back street <laughs> with a bunch of eight-year-olds. Um, so they are looking at more flexible ways people could involve give time in smaller chunks in different ways that fit with, um, as people have been saying already, with their motivations and their ideas and their skills and their knowledge and the things that they want to do. And that effectively is flexible volunteering. It's um, volunteering that, that fits their motivations, their skills, their time commitments. It could be something like enabling people to choose the time and the place that they volunteer. It could be about job sharing, so you have two or three people working on the same volunteer role, but they split the responsibilities between them. Um, it could be that they're helping from home, volunteering remotely online. Um, we had talked a bit yesterday about citizen science, doing things on, you know, on your computer. There's a load of stuff happening in physics, astronomy, um, biology, you know, ecology, you know, going out and counting butterflies, that sort of thing. It could be about tailored roles. So taking the person as an individual, talking to them about their skills and their interests and building a role around that rather than saying, we want people to do this thing and expecting everyone to fit into that box. It could be about family volunteering, childcare responsibilities. The cost in the UK of looking after ch children is huge. Um, it's a big chunk of people's family budgets. If you can offer them opportunities where the whole family can volunteer together, they're not having to spend that expense on looking, finding childcare so that they can volunteer themselves. It could be about short-term roles. People don't know where they're going to be living in six months' time, let alone what they might be doing with their time. So can you, you know, give them something to do for a day or a week or a month rather than expecting them to sign up for year after year after year, which is kind of the old model of scout volunteering. This is a quote from Time Bank, which is an organisation that does, um, it, you kind of log the hours that you volunteer and you get rewards in return um, from businesses and things like that, so discounts and shops. Today's volunteers aren't looking to marry you, they simply want to date and see where it might lead to. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about our model of volunteering in Thames Discovery Programme. Um, 
we kind of inadvertently created a flexible volunteering model for archaeology 10 years ago, um, which actually works really well. There are a lot of different ways people can get involved with Thames Discovery Programme. Once they've done their training, they have options. They can take part in field work. They can do monitoring visits. They can help with outreach. We have volunteers doing guided walks, doing talks, putting, doing finds handling sessions. They help with research projects. They go into the archives. They dig out um, all the old documents and, and consolidate it for us. We've got our tadpoles. Our volunteers are known as frogs, which is for sure recording and observation group. So we've just started a young archaeologists <laughs> club called the Tadpoles. Um, <laughs> so you can help with that. We've also got an oral history project. We're looking at the foreshore at low tide. So we're talking to the people that have li worked, lived on the river, worked on the foreshore, boat building, fishermen, rowers, um, all sorts of people like that. And so our volunteers are involved in that as well. So there's a lot of different options. And it's all very flexible to talk about our field work and our monitoring. The field work, we don't expect people to sign up for a set period. We send out the dates at the beginning of the year. We do a week of field work about once a month. People can pick and choose which days they come to. So if you have um, work in the week, you can come at the weekends. If you are um, free in the week but busy at the weekends, you can come in the week. If I, I used to volunteer for the project and work full time. And there were days where I'd take a morning off work because we only have about three or four hours on the foreshore and then go into the office in the afternoon. And I could do that with this project. So I've worked in London as well. And um, monitoring visits are generally organised by the volunteers themselves, so they can pick the dates and times when they go out. We are also constrained by the tides, so that does limit it a little bit. Um, but you know, it's still something that they can self-organise and, and fit around everything else in their life. And also they can do stuff like bring their children along while they're doing it. So this is our site. It, the other thing about our model and the way we work, we've got about 30, 40 key sites across London. I mean, this is I you know geography you can't do very much about if you're working in a remote rural site. There's, there's not a lot you can do about it. But the advantage of being in a big city is you've got all the public transport. Just about everyone in London will be able to get to at least one of our sites very easily by public transport, which is great. We've got a mix of locations. So there's a mix of types of archaeology as well, if you're interested in that. Um, and you can be on site for as long as you're able. The way we run our field work, we don't expect people to commit to the whole session. So if somebody's physically um, got some physical impairments, they can just come down for an hour or so and then and go after that. Um, and like I say, it's, it's not just field work and also family and friends can volunteer together as well, which is a real benefit. Um, so yeah, this is just a few things that we've achieved. Uh, we've trained 700 volunteers over the 10 years, recorded over a thousand features, Organised 700 plus events. We've lost track and I'm sure it's way higher than that. And, and won two British Archaeological Awards and we've actually been nominated for another one. Um, and we also do a lot of digital outreach as well. So if you're not able to get out with us, maybe because you don't live in London, you can still follow on along with our work online and on social media. So yeah, thank you. Thank you.